I remember when I was like 10, 11, 12 years old, the other teams used to call me Rocket Roger Crane. My name is Scott Gladstone, the voice of the Range Riders. I'm with Jesse Crane. Uh, who's come on as a, a consultant for the coaching staff. Jesse, you're a, uh, you know, you played 10 plus years in the bigs um, and you're an all-star. You have this really impressive resume. I want to talk about uh, all that. And we're going to start with that and kind of finish up talking about um, your involvement with the range riders and, and, and kind of um, what you hope to help achieve in Glacier. First of all, thanks for having me. And I'm excited to be a part of the range riders. Um, I always loved baseball. From a very young age, playing baseball, I always had a very strong arm. I think my dad got me out playing pitch with footballs and baseballs early on, and my, my arm was always strong from, from the very beginning. I remember I remember when I was like 10, 11, 12 years old, the other team used to call me Rocket Roger Crane, but I always wanted to play shortstop and not just pitch, so I tried to play position as long as possible, um, which I did. Um, in high school, I would I would start in short at shortstop. I'd come in and, and close the games out, um, and that's what I did through my you know the three years I played on varsity. And we lost my senior year. We lost in the state championship game. I had started pitching the in the semifinals, and then uh, was at shortstop in, in the championship game. We lost to a pretty well known school in Colorado, Cherry Creek, who was who was good for a long long time. They're always good every year, um, but. Um, and I say I got high school state player of the year that year. So, um, yeah, I mean, I through through high school, I played basketball, baseball and football. Um, I ended up stopping retiring from football after my sophomore year when I wanted to focus more on baseball. I had opportunities to go play for Cherry Creek actually in the fall and come down to Arizona and play in some fall uh, showcases, which I thought was more important than playing football because I felt like that was going to be more my path. So, um yeah, that's kind of how I, I went through through high school. But, um, you know, I never really thought about going professional or anything at that point. I think I just tried to play and get better year by year by year. I didn't really have a long, long-term goal. I mean, I guess when I got to junior, senior year, I knew I wanted to try to go to college. But I was never, you know, looking too far ahead. I was usually going kind of doing one step at a time. You take a route that a lot of a lot of different baseball players, a lot of different um... – you know, guys that have ended up in the show have taken, which is the JUCO route. And it's kind of this uh, this thing that you, you don't really know it unless you've been there. Um, you know, it, it's a grind and um, and a lot of guys are, you know, some, some going in just wanting to play a little bit longer, but others, you know, have a dream of, of kind of turning junior college into, you know, maybe a four year school and then making the jump to uh, professional baseball and trying to work their way up the minors. Um for somebody who doesn't understand uh, a kind of that JUCO grind, uh, what is it about that, that that helped develop you a lot in your career? I mean, I think me and a lot of, you know, normal kids are kind of like, especially years ago, I think it might have changed a little, might have changed a little bit now, but, you know, everyone wants to see the big lights, right? They want to go D1. They well, they see the uniforms, they see the stadiums, they want to like, and if you're a, real, a good player and you have, you know, you're talking to teams, you're like, that's where you want to go. And that's kind of what I did. So out of high school, out of Colorado, I actually went to the University of Texas. So I went to the University of Texas for my fall of my freshman year. I went there to play shortstop and to pitch. Um, I went through all of fall, did all, all the workouts, everything, schooling and all that. And um, literally the day that I was flying back home to Colorado for Christmas break, I had all of my meetings and everything. I got a call from a head coach, which was the late Augie Garrido, um, pretty much telling me that he wanted to, in short term, wanted to bring in a shortstop from JUCO to start for him that spring, and they wanted to use my scholarship. Um, um, it didn't go over that well. He ended up flying out to Colorado the next day and apologizing because he kind of went after me a little bit um, out of the blue. Um, but he had set me up to go to a JUCO, San Jacinto Junior College in Houston, Texas, which I had no idea what that was. I didn't really know what JUCO was, nor did I know where San Jack was at all. Um, I learned pretty quickly that they were a very, very solid program. Um, so long story short, I, I was like, well, I don't want to be here anymore. Then I'll go down to San Jack. I went down to San Jack for my fr that, that spring, my freshman spring. Uh, kind of coming in, they already had their shortstop um, penciled in, who had hit like 17 home runs the year before. And so I kind of came in as just going to pitch. 
uh, at least at the beginning. Um, the first game we had, I threw like two plus innings um, and I, I, I did well. And I ended up becoming the starting shortstop, you know, the next week or two. And I ended up those two years at San Jack, I only played, pitched 10 innings. I played shortstop the whole time. Um, we had a really good staff. Our first year, we went to the JUCO World Series in Grand Junction. Um, our sophomore year, we brought back everybody, and we were like number one in the nation. And we we couldn't get out of regionals, unfortunately. But um, I'm a big JUCO fan. Like for my son, who's a junior in high school, if he has a chance to play JUCO, I'm I'm all for it because you know it really kind of weeds out everybody. You go there, you grind. You know, you want to play. If you if you want to go to the next level, you got to play. Um, and then you go there for two years, and if and if you do well you know, you have a good chance to go to really any D1 you want to go to. Um, your options are a lot more than they are at a high school. And then also you can be drafted each of those years. So um, I'm a huge proponent of, of junior college baseball and San Jack was probably the best, best thing that best move that ever happened to me uh, looking back on it. And that summer I had two tryout camps, uh, one for the Rockies and one for the D-backs uh, to be drafted. I did, I did work out as an infielder and I worked out as pitching as a pitcher. Um, each of those there, there, everyone was kind of looking at me more as a, um, probably a pitcher just cause of my arm was so strong and, you know, I was a solid shortstop, but I didn't have the speed or, or anything like that. So on the mound, I was throwing 93, 94, but I hadn't really, you know, refined my pitching cause I hadn't done it in two years. So, um, they kind of asked me each, each of those teams asked me what, if I had signed and I'm like, yeah, I'd sign. And they're like, what'd you sign for? I'm like, I had no idea what to say. I'm like a hundred grand. Um, well, Looking back, they no one neither of them drafted me that year at all, and that's back when they had fifty rounds of draft uh, of draft. So, ended up going to University of Houston, um, and that's kind of where my career really took off. Um, I got back into pitching again. They had a their late pitching coach Brad Stockton, who had managed there years before. Um, he got me back into pitching, so I would start at shortstop and then I'd come in and close. Um, and that spring, I was actually ended up being an All-American utility for shortstop and pitching. And in 45 innings, I didn't give up an a earned run until my last outing in the Super Regional, which happened to be back at University of Texas. And uh, we ended up losing in three games, and they won the national championship. It's funny how the whole thing went full circle. And um, I guess overall, my, my point of all this is that everybody has a different path um, to get to wherever they're getting in baseball. Mine obviously was a little bit different than a lot of one, but there's no, there's no perfect line. And I look at that through all the sports. There's no perfect, you can't create something and there's no perfect uh, way to get somewhere in, in sports. Um, there's a lot of things that have to work out and a lot of things that happen that change the direct trajectory of, of different things. So um, I enjoy telling my story because it, it's not like, you know, all lights and, everything worked out perfect. I went from high school to D one to first round draft pick and all that is kind of, I had to grind a little bit and go to three different schools and, um, you know, learn my way and make my own path. So I really, uh, I really appreciate the, the path that I went down. Yeah. And then of, of course you start your professional journey. Um, and you started in the twins organization and they did not have a pioneer league affiliate. Um, like, you know, a handful. I mean, I grew up watching the Helena Brewers, which of course were the Brewers um, affiliates. Um, and, you know, the Reds organization is still really present in Billings and um, Diamondbacks and in Missoula. Um, but you still get this experience at the minor league level and realizing, uh, you know, in Quad Cities, Iowa, um, and in Elizabethtown in the Appy League, which is now summer collegiate ball, um, you get you get to start to understand this this minor league where it's you know it's a lot of young guys recently drafted um you know very similar to to you know what the pioneer league what the range riders are now um but guys just kind of itching for their chance and what, what what was that like to you know come in and you know you realize you're still kind of a long way um from making it to the MLB um, but still, I'm sure the atmosphere at times and, and the passion from the fan base and everything, just like Glacier is, you know, it, it feels like like this is a big time thing, even though it feels so far away from the show. What, what was that that minor league experience like? So I, I ended up getting drafted out of Houston just as a pitcher in the second round by the Minnesota Twins. And at that time, it was actually when they were talking about uh, going into contraction. So I don't even know if the Twins were going to be around 
you know, much longer than they were. But luckily, they um, they had a few good years there. They made the playoffs three years in a row, so that was fine. But um, yeah, it was for me. It was kind of it was different because I'd always played you know, in the field my whole career and I'd come in and close. So when I was drafted as strictly a pitcher, it was a little different. I didn't know what to do with myself. So now I'm going straight to pro ball and I have all this time, you know, I'm getting to the park at like two o'clock and we don't play till seven. I'm like, what am I doing? I'm not taking batting practice. I'm not taking ground balls. Like, what am I going to do to, you know, fill this gap of five hours before the game? So that took me a little bit of time to kind of figure out a schedule, kind of an, a routine to do every day that took – you know, that probably took me a few years to figure out. But um, when I so when I first signed, I went straight to Elizabeth Beth in Tennessee in short season A ball and um, started pitching really well. I got a pitch against wood bats. I hadn't done that at all. I started against metal, you know, all through college. So to me, I felt like I had a big advantage to that. I felt like if I could get my fastball in, like these guys wouldn't have a chance. And I don't know, I just carried that confidence in every outing and was able to throw really well there for about two weeks. Um, and after two weeks, they moved me up to quad cities to low a ball and um, kind of did the same thing. I threw really well for about two weeks, got to go, uh, go to the first round of playoffs. We ended up losing, but um, got another two weeks there. And then they sent me straight to uh, instructional league. And so, I mean, throwing a Houston, I threw, I think 40 something innings. And then I threw another 25 or so, um, that summer. So I by far was throwing the most I had in my whole life. Um, Instruction league is probably the best learning experience I had just because I learned a lot of things. I learned routines. I learned um, that's where I think I started just throwing out of the stretch opposed to being in a full windup. I uh, started the next year in uh, Florida, in the Florida state league at Fort Myers, which is our spring training facility actually. And just kind of carried it on. I didn't look too far ahead. I was just going step by step. I always had a goal like, Obviously, when you're in the minor leagues, you try to go up, go up, go up, go up. And I always felt comfortable with that. I always liked having, you know, something to strive for. I think that's the way I, I run. So getting into A ball, I started there. I remember my first outing, I gave up like two runs. I'm like, uh-oh, this is seems a little bit more difficult than last year. Well, after that, I, I went on a good run. Um, and then the last outing I had there, which is like a, a month into the season, I uh, had a kind of a rough one. I gave up a three, I think three or four runs, kind of lost my control. And I remember riding on the bus home. We were in Sarasota, Florida. We rode, rode the bus home because it's a commuting trip. And uh, I got called in by the manager. I'm like, oh, man, what did I do? And come to find out, a couple of kids in double A had gotten in a fist fight, two pitchers, and uh, they needed to call somebody up. And sure enough, that was a break for me. They called me up, uh, went to double A, and really through I mean I threw the I don't know I don't know what clicked there I think just like I said the motivation of going up and, and having somewhere to go I, I pitched really well there I got more consistent I remember throwing my curveball a lot there um, I can't explain exactly what it was but I always had that motivation to want to move up move up move up and um, granted being in you know in minor league ball where we have the, all the different affiliates I think that kind of lended itself to be easier for me but um, and also just focusing on pitching, I, I was able to blossom like that. But um, I really liked, I really liked the going up the levels. I really think that motivated me to go go higher and higher. Um, so, anyways, I would double A, and then that year I went from A ball to double A, and all the way to triple A, and finished the year in triple A. But back in those days, that was two thousand three. I mean, I had guys in triple A that were thirty years old that had been playing for a long time. Where we, if we talk about it later, I'm not sure, but it's really changed a lot now. And now AAA, I mean, if you're over 25, 26, I mean, you're old there now. I mean, they've really kind of transformed the way the game is. And guys don't hang around as long. They they get out of the game earlier. Um, they're looking for younger guys. So it's really transformed a lot. But I feel like in AAA, that's where I learned the most as far as pitching goes because I had veterans that knew how to hit. Um, and I couldn't just throw balls by guys and – they actually had a plan when they were up there. When you're in the, in the lower leagues, they kind of guys just go up there and kind of hack. Well, these guys knew what they were doing and they could set you up. They knew what to look for. And that really kind of helped me, you know, get ready for the big leagues because they actually knew how to hit. Um, so every, I, I took it, I learned everything, something from every level, but definitely facing those older guys was probably the, my biggest learning curve for sure. 
and then of course you do make that breakthrough. You get to the MLB. Um, you had a lot of a lot of highs, a lot of incredible uh, seasons, incredible moments. Uh, what, what were some of the highlights for you um, of the MLB part of your career? Being called up for the first time was a highlight. Um, at the first game, I got called up for so. I got called up in 2004. That's the year the Red Sox ended up winning the World Series. And I got called up uh, August 1st. Doug Mankiewicz was the first baseman for the Twins, and he got traded across the field to uh, the Red Sox. And I came up and took Mankiewicz's spot on our roster. And that first game I flew in, I remember it flew in Sunday morning, and it was Johan Santana versus Pedro Martinez. Um, I didn't get in that game, but I had the best seat in the bullpen watching, you know, those, you know, those pitchers were two of the, two of the best in the game during those years. Um, and then obviously looking back, they ended up Red Sox ended up winning the World Series that year. So, you know, that's something I'll never forget. And then my first outing was a few days later. I came in and faced Vladimir Guerrero with the bases loaded in the fifth inning. And I did my job. I got a ground ball to short, but the shortstop threw it away. So um, but it's something that I'll remember forever. Um, so that's one highlight. Um, I got to play for Team Canada for Canada for the World Baseball Classic, which was really cool. I, uh, being born there, I got the opportunity to be able to play there and be the closer for the team because that's something I always, you know, I did in the minor leagues and I always enjoyed being a closer. And I got the opportunity to do that for Team Canada. So, you know, being in those tournaments was a lot of fun. Um, that's something I'd never really done before. So I really enjoyed that. Going to the playoffs four times with the Twins. We went to the, we ne- unfortunately, we never made it out of the uh, first round. And we lost to the Yankees three times, which is super frustrating. That's why I'm not a Yankees fan. But um, just being able to pitch in old Yankee Stadium in the playoffs um, is something I'll never forget because there was nothing like that. You know, that's their new stadium is nothing like the old one was. Um, and just facing those lineups they had back in the day was crazy. When I left the Twins and I went to the White Sox, I think that was a huge um, – breath of fresh air going somewhere new and um, kind of doing my own thing. And I really blossomed my three years in Chicago. And that's when I was an all-star one year. And then my last year, actually, I never threw a pitch after it, but I made the all-star game, which and that was probably, that's probably my biggest highlight uh, being able to go, even though I didn't throw a pitch, but it was in New York at, at a uh, city field. It was Mariano Rivera's last year playing um, and just being with, you know, all those guys I played against for years, which was was pretty special and having my family and everything, you know, be able to go out there and, you know, it's, it's crazy that at that time, obviously I didn't know that was going to be the last time that would ever happen, let alone throw a pitch before that. Um, but I guess it's kind of a cool way to end your career. Um, I ended up playing with Houston after that too, but I never, never threw a pitch again. So, um, it was kind of, I don't know, it's, it's bittersweet to look back on. It's like, is it good going out on top when you made it all-star and you never threw again? Or do you want to keep grinding and until the, you get forced out? I don't know what the answer is, but um, um, I can't complain too much. I got I got some good time and met a lot of good people, and uh, I'm happy with how my career went. So, something, you know, you mentioned being a closer for Team Canada and the minors before. Obviously, that's kind of that premier relief pitcher role. Um, but you were much more of, you know, a, a middle, middle late inning guy, um, in the MLB. What is, what is that like to be in that role where, you know, you don't know, know necessarily when your name's going to be called every night mm-hmm. or if it's going to end, um, and, and, or if it's going to be called and, um, and, and you also kind of don't know, you know, what the situation's going to be. So for yeah. you. Um, how did, how did you adjust to those situations kind of coming in, not, not knowing exactly what you're going to face every night? Well, when I, when I went up with the twins, we had a guy named, and I'm sure baseball fans would remember him, Joe Nathan, who was probably one of the best, if not the best, him and Rivera were probably the best closers for about a five or six year stretch. And so I had no chance to have be a closer for them. And cause he was so good. So that's when I first got, I started, uh, set, being a setup guy, um, to me, and I'm probably a little biased. There's a, I would say, more times than not, you're in tougher positions than the closer is. Um, you're going in there when the game's on the line, sixth, seventh, eighth inning, guys all over the bases. You know, tying runs on third base with one out, and you know, you have to get out of the inning without you know trying to keep that guy there. Um, not taking anything away from closing the game because obviously you're in tough situations there, and it's always the last thing. But in those situations, you kind of put yourself there. 
And when you come in and as a setup guy, granted, you can put yourself there as well, but a lot of times you're coming in with guys all over the bases to get, and you have to get them out. Um, I kind of re- related to it as like a field goal kicker, you either do your job and you kind of go under the radar or you, or you blow it and everyone's mad. Right. So, um, yeah, it's, it was something that took me a couple years to get comfortable with. I think I really, I really blossomed, uh, to it with the white Sox. Um, there I throw one of the, you know, veteran guys and I definitely could have been the closer, but they were so comfortable with me throwing the seventh and eighth inning that they would put a rookie as throwing the ninth inning and they'd have me and one of my other uh, guys, Matt Thornton, a lefty, we would be the guys that come in to clean up the innings in the seventh and eighth inning to get guys off the bases. And then they give the clean inning to a, a younger guy. I really got comfortable throwing all my pitches at any counts coming in with guys on base. You know, I probably rarely threw a first pitch fastball. Maybe my first two pitches were usually sliders. I kind of lived off of that. Um, you kind of play to the hitters, you know, aggressiveness because they want to get those guys in. So I kind of really learned how to attack guys and mix my pitches up and, you know, be comfortable throwing any pitch at any time. Um, I think that really forced me to do that. And, you know, I got really comfortable doing it. First of all, just just explain to me kind of how you got involved uh, with, with the Range Riders organization. Just just kind of explain that origin story. Yeah, um, it's kind of funny how it happened kind of organically. Um, you know, over the last couple of years, so the last I've been retired for about seven years now, and I have three kids and, you know, been able to been blessed to be able to be with them every single day for the last seven years as they grow up. And, you know, it's, I'm kind of getting to the point now where I want to start branching out and doing some things. And I've been, you know, thinking of different things and what I wanted to do and all that. Um, and we have some friends in Whitefish. In the last two summers, we've gone out there for about three or four days. And I remember two years ago, we went out there and I was told that the, they were going to build a new stadium and they're getting a new team. And I'm like, that would be awesome, especially up here. And it's beautiful. And I think that'd be great. The league, you know, being able to be a part of the Pioneer League, which is a cool existing league, um, sounded like a great idea. Well, fast forward to this past summer, a couple months ago, we went back up there with our same friends and they took me out to the stadium before a game. Um, kind of walked around and saw how beautiful the place was. And like, man, they did a great job. This is by far the nicest stadium in this league, for sure. This could be a, easily be a triple A stadium. Um, thought it was really cool. I mean, everything about it was awesome. Um, I ended up leaving town and, and my friends ended up um, talking with Chris and Marty. Um, and they kind of mentioned my name about, you know, maybe, you know, doing something for the organization or wanting to get back into it. And so next thing I know, I get a, a get connected with Chris and we just start talking and I think we hit it off right away. We kind of believe in the same things baseball wise and, you know, kind of, he asked me what I'd be willing to do and what I had time to do. And we kind of just worked something out where I'm able to be a part of this organization and help them out on many different levels. Um, so the last homestand um, I flew up and was able to kind of get my feet wet of meeting everybody, seeing the players, seeing how things work, the day to day, you know, life, for me, trying to kind of get it back into it, I got to I got to you know, sit in the dugout for the games, which I hadn't done in years. So, um, you know, kind of got the blood flowing again of of liking to get out there, and you know, I really like helping helping pitchers kind of learn things and more of the the mental side of things, how to get through things and what to think when you're out there, and you know how to you know get the most out of yourself and and come back the next day when things don't go well, and those are the kind of things I like, which I feel like I can give the most feedback back by you know, the experiences that I had, but, um, something that worked out, you know, really cool. And I'm excited to be a part of this organization. The stadium is going to be beautiful. It is beautiful. It's by far the best in the league, by by far one of the best probably in the country. Um, and it wasn't even finished. So that, that's going to be amazing. It's going to draw a, a lot of, um, a, a lot of fans there and B more importantly, it's going to draw, bring a lot of players there. A lot of players are going to want to come and play in that stadium. I mean, it's, it's um, unbelievable. Uh, the facilities that they're going to have, the everyday life is going to be so much better playing at a place like that. The atmosphere that Chris and Marty have brought out there, the family atmosphere, the, the you know, between innings. And I think it's just, it's going to, it's a perfect fit for up there. I also think that um, independent ball is growing a lot um, since they've shortened the draft, since they're kind of cutting down minor league teams, um, I think independent ball is going to become a bigger, even bigger player than it has been in the past. I think 
there's going to be a lot more players going to good players playing in the, in the independent leagues that give themselves a chance to go to affiliated baseball. So I think those are all positive um, things that are going to, you know, just help independent baseball and specifically, you know, the range riders. I think with everything that we have and the, and the people they're putting together, Chris and Marty are putting together, it's just going to, you know, I think we're going to have a really good chance of having really good competitive teams and hopefully see a lot of, you know, players come through there that maybe you see in, in the big leagues someday. Um, because I really do think this, the game is changing and independent ball is going to, you know, is blossoming for sure. When you're trying to help those guys out as somebody who played, you know, Juco ball and then went to a four-year college, what, what's going to be kind of your advice to, to those guys that, you know, have a dream of playing the MLB and know that, you know, the odds are, are kind of against them. What's, what's your advice to those type of guys? You can't control what another team's going to do. You can't control someone's thought process of what they think of you or not. So I think the biggest thing is, is, you know, I'm going to reach out to these guys, this, the one, the pitchers that we have coming back this winter. And obviously they're going to have to work their tails off to, um, you know, we could work together to figure out what their strengths are and where they can get better at that. Because, you know, the good news is for the pitchers, I mean, those are probably the, the most of the guys that have a chance to get picked up. You know, it's going to be easier for every team's looking for arms. So they have the better opportunity than probably the position players do overall. Um, but having a plan in the offseason to work your tails off to – the game has changed to the spin rate and to, you know, high – you know, fastballs, hard fastballs. So I think they all have to kind of unfortunately work on getting stronger um, in that sense. But on on top of that, stay within yourself and understand what your game is and, you know, just control what you can. Um, Like when the season starts, it's like you just have to go out there and, you know, have the trust and faith of what you, how hard you worked in the off season and put, bring that onto the field. Cause the more, the more you try to do out there, the harder the game is. It's, you can't pitch that way. You have to really just go one pitch at a time and trust all the work you put in in the, in the off season to have success on the mound during the season. So I think that's kind of what I try to push across to these guys is that, Hey, the off season right now is where you work to get better, get stronger and get ready for the season. And then once that season starts, you have what you have and that's when you, the mental side really kicks in and um, you don't overdo it and you stick to what you're good at with slowing the game down. And that just takes time. And, you know, that's the mental side of things you learn as you go out there. 